Hello and welcome to Roadmap 2023, our election issues and personalities tracking program. I'm Ladi Akiri Duluale. Thanks for joining us. My guest on today's edition says, securing Nigeria is not just a question of equipment and personnel, but also of providing the indices of a decent human existence, such as education, health, and social benefits for the vulnerable, which will be done if he's elected president in this month's election. My guest also thinks that the system is rigged against the youthful segment of the country, and that if the country is to make progress, it must break the hold of those described as buccaneers on the livers of political power. Roadmap 2023 talks to human rights activist and presidential candidate of the African Action Congress Party, the AAC, Mr. Omoyele Shore. Omoyele Shore, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. Let's, uh, let me begin from uh, the statement that this has been described, the 2023 elections have been described as uh, an election of the youth, and you would fall uh, squarely within that bracket. But then those who have pointed out that it is a youthful election also point out that uh, there seems to be the absence of a strategy among those in that bracket uh, to ensure that one of them uh, is the one who wins the coveted seat, including uh, someone like you. Uh, what do you make of, uh, of that assessment? Is it valid? Well, it's not valid, considering that uh, <clears throat> everybody is pushing an agenda that promotes the old system. And um, once you have that, once you have adults who or older people who are politically in control in Nigeria, who are financially in control of the political space, then it doesn't matter which strategy you use. And this includes also our brothers and sisters in the media who promote frontliners who have no strategy at all, have no manifesto, who don't attend to interviews uh, as frontliners. So the strategy that's needed for someone to win an election is for them to be able to speak potentially to the greatness of their ideas and how that can promote a better society. And that is well done by young people in the race. But the question is, do the young people have the war chest to bribe people uh, to fill a stadium? Uh, the answer is no. Do young people have the capacity to go out there and get their ideas aired to masses of our people who want to vote? Yes, but is the medium out there to do that also not susceptible to the old style of politicking? Uh, that's where the issue is. But you need to have been at the NBA where all these younger candidates, I, I don't think there's anybody that can be called a youth, but youthful candidates, were speaking to the ideas about economic development, the rule of law in the country, administration of justice, and the issue of security, you'll be wowed. But I, I, it was in broadcast life, and I've not seen a sniper of it in any of the major media houses today. So in terms of strategy, we are good. You know, in fact, the strategies we have adopted in our own campaign in the African Action Congress is ahead of. You know, we have jettisoned those ideas that are no longer current in terms of how campaigning is done. We opted for town hall meetings. We are attending. Uh, meetings with professionals all around the country. You know, we're speaking truth to power. We are discussing the ideas about how to increase electricity in the country, how to solve the security problem from the human security angle, from a development angle. We are talking about how to fund education in a way that every student in the country can get not only access to good education, but get quality education. We're talking about healthcare that is driven by modern systems of uh, uh, treatment and uh, care for people. We're talking about how to expand the agricultural space in such a way that Nigeria can live sustainably. Uh, we're talking about development goals that will make Nigeria become competitive uh, within the international community. But people who are supposed to be promoting these ideas, of course, don't do that deliberately because I think they prefer the old system to be in place uh, and it's in the interest of the older generation. So that's, that's the real issue. So when you have that, then you start questioning whether there's a strategy. 
But when you look at the strategies adopted by our party, by our candidates, you will know that they are the best. And they were the best in 2018 when people uh, claimed that uh, we didn't win in an election that did not happen. So strategy is fantastic. Uh, but in terms of uh, why you in the media and others, I'm not talking about you specifically, refuse to broadcast these ideas is what we should be talking about and should be concerned about. Given that, um, of course, I'm not going to stand in defense of the media, uh, perhaps uh, I, I, all I can do or, or say in that respect is that uh, I know that uh, we and as channels, uh, we have always provided the platform for everyone to air their views. But I want to go back to the question I asked. Um, whether or not you have a war chest or whether or not indeed uh, the media has played a salutary role in the process or not, we have seen it elsewhere that when the young or the youthful, let me use your phrase, uh, have, uh, have come together, uh, none of these barriers has presented them or has prevented them uh, from actually uh, putting in place something that they want. Uh, because they have the numbers, and democracy is about numbers. But you referenced 2019. One of the reasons many people gave in 2019 uh, for why uh, uh, the, the youth or the youthful candidates uh, did not seem to make much of an impact, put aside whatever else may have happened, was that, first of all, there were too many of you, and that when it was opportune for you to uh, uh, kind of form some kind of alliance, it broke down. And many people were saying, you guys had learned nothing from those who were older than you. It's from that context that I'm coming when I ask the question, why does it seem to be that the youth themselves, given that they have the numbers, are not able to impose their will uh, on the system, no matter uh, how that system is skewed against them? Well, when system are skewed against you in a way that it bastardizes you with hunger, unemployment, it reduces your dignity to next to zero. And you now have elders who play divisive roles in the society and don't want young people to progress, as they've always done where, when I was in primary school. Elders came to us and said, we are the leaders of tomorrow. But the elders in the country, in their 80s, in their 90s, those who are politically connected or those who control the political levers as far as they are concerned, are still choosing leaders for the youth, then you can understand. An average young person in the U.S. who has a job, who don't rely on uh, uh, giveaways, who don't rely on uh, uh, takeouts from politicians, has independence to make these decisions. But you have been, the young people in Nigeria have been targeted over time so that they, don't have, they won't have a voice. You look at the history of young people in Nigeria, from even the 40s, 50s, 1950s, 1960s, they had independence because most of the young people in Nigeria that started the Nigerian youth movement could afford to go to school in the UK, complete their education, mostly on scholarship from the Nigerian government, come back and take political decisions for the country. That is why Nahura, at the age of 30, was able to move the motion for independence of Nigeria. But here we are, here we are, that the barriers are not just one. They are psychological, they are physical, they are economic. So at the end, it's easy for you to get an influencer, for example, on Twitter, who is a young person, who understands that this country can never move in the right direction with the kind of politics uh, that those older candidates are playing. But they will, they will fall for it because that's their means of livelihood. They, 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 you know, they have to put aside principles. In those days, people don't have to put aside principles. And I want to go to 2019. The people that you, 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 are, you are referring to in 2019 who met and said, oh, we should choose a candidate, ask yourself, where are they today? I'm the only person standing from that team. And the moment we met for the first time, and that was the only meeting I went to, and they were saying that it's the elders that said they should choose a youth for them that they can work with. That was the day I left the meeting. And this happened at Charlie Boy's house. They said to my face that the elders in the country don't want an aggressive youth to be a candidate. They want somebody they can work with. And I said, no, it's the youth that should choose their candidates. And the others will accept it. So, and I've said this before, and that is why I'm still sitting here today, because I never compromised my standard, my position at that time. You know all the young people that ran in 20, 
2019, ask yourself, where are they today? The only person that tried to come back who is younger was uh, Kisli Mogalu. They took him to Abe Okuta in Obasanjo's hotel and ridiculed him. Because why? They didn't want, they know that if he came out, probably he will not step down for the candidates they want. And they don't want a radical person. I'm just saying that so that you can understand the context under which young people's decision are not making it to the mainstream. All these obstacles we are talking about don't exist elsewhere. It doesn't exist in America. Young people can decide for themselves because they have jobs, they have homes, they have cars, you know, when they want to drive them. They don't have to go and beg some elder uh, to give them money. They don't even beg their parents for money after they are 18 years old, mostly. So if you go to South Africa, where, you know, young people have independence because you don't have police always shooting at them when they want to meet. You know, that's why you see a Julius Malema in South Africa, who can go to the parliament, confront the president of the country, actually kick him out of power, and still go home and sleep. You cannot insult, according to Nigeria's uh, terminology, you can't talk to the president of Nigeria and go back home alive. You know, I was charged after the 2019 election, I was charged for insulting the president. <laughs> and I spent five months in detention and three years in restriction here in Abuja. Those are the kind of obstacles we face as young people in the country. And people must live with that reality. But should we not also blame the young people who keep falling for the tricks of uh, these older persons who don't want them to progress? Of course, we blame them too, because they don't need to beg them to liberate themselves. That's why our party provides that platform to, for total liberation. And I'm the only candidate, and I can say it anywhere, who you probably have met or known who doesn't have any ties to the old system of this country, who the old political system. They didn't send me to school, they didn't find me a job, and they didn't make me. You know, everything I had in life, I worked hard for it. And that's why they find it difficult for, to relate with, you know, the kind of concept of politics that we, uh, that we exude. And the confidence with which I say to them that, look, I don't have to beg anybody. I'm not going to meet anybody in his house who has ruined Nigeria to endorse me for a political office. Never. And that is why we are different. This is our position, and it remains the position of credible youth in the country. And you will be surprised that this youth might just take that position that we have been waiting for. But it doesn't have to be endorsed by the same political buccaneers in the country who have made this country ungovernable or turned into ungoverned spaces today. Let me ask you then, uh, because the way you have, you have come out uh, across it, and I know you have been at this uh, for a very long time. You and I have uh, uh, related uh, uh, officially and unofficially for more than 30 years, so I know uh, where you are coming from. So I guess the next question will be, why do you persist then? Because if the system and the obstacles are as you have described, then why do you persist? Uh, if in 2019 all of you met uh, the way you've explained it, and at the end you couldn't come to some kind of agreement. This is 2023. Why is it that you persist? Because all the obstacles you describe are still there now in 2023. You, you know, what is happening here is that some people and a lot of us have a historical duty to break these bonds. We have a historical duty to break our chains. Uh, you could ask the same thing of Malcolm X. You could ask the same thing of... Uh, Malta King. You go ask Mandela why he decided to sit down in jail for 27 years instead of signing up to the apartheid regime and becoming a minister in a few weeks after he was uh, detained when they asked him to surrender uh, to them and dismantle the ANC. Uh, you can ask the same of those people who persisted against colonial rule. You know, why don't you just let the colonials uh, continue since we feel inferior to them? So I don't accept that, and a lot of people don't accept that. Those who are queuing up to buy petrol at 1,000 naira per liter don't want the situation to persist. Those who are looking for new naira notes that they claim were redesigned don't want to persist in this condition. Those who are sick and don't have hospital care at this point, those who are dying on our roads, and those who have spent nine months uh, at home uh, instead of uh, two semesters already gone, don't want the situation to persist. I don't want also to persist in misery. I don't want to live in a country of my birth in which I'm a prisoner inside the country. So we persist against all these odds because we deserve better. 
not, there's no point uh, debating surrender. The people and the only conditions that must surrender are the oppressors and the oppressive conditions and the bondage that they have put our people. Those, those are the people that must, uh, you know, must be forced to surrender. Not me. I have persisted against this all, like you said, uh, since uh, I met you for the first time around 1993. Uh, and that's three decades ago. So, and uh, a lot of things have happened since then. You know, if, I didn't, if we didn't persist in 1993, we won't have democracy in 1999. So if we didn't persist in uh, 2007, we would have had Obasanjo continue his third term. If we didn't persist under Yaradua, Jonathan would not have become president, uh, the first person to come from a land. So the persistence is done so that we can break the yoke of oppression and the burden place on our people to perpetually live in misery. It's unacceptable and we must persist against it so that we can live a better life. If we don't, our children deserve better. Now, uh, one of the things I noted and which uh, came to me as some kind of surprise because that went against the grain of what most people were saying uh, was that the electoral process uh, has evolved over time as well and has become, in their words, uh, more credible and uh, more trustworthy, has produced more outcomes that reflect more and more the will of the people as we have gone down uh, the democracy trail. But I, I noted that you uh, and your party uh, expressed some level of distrust in the electoral management body. And I was wondering what that was for, because uh, given everything that we have been told, uh, we should expect that this election will be free and fair, at least coming from the angle of preparations and processes uh, that have been put in place to ensure that. You don't agree? No, I don't agree because it is not true that our electoral, uh, electoral process have been credible over time. The last time we saw a credible election in this country was 1993. And because it was credible, the political class annulled the election. It's the reason you saw me standing up in that meeting with the former head of state, who is the chairman of the Peace, uh, National Peace Committee, telling him that I have disagreement, fundamental disagreement with their generation for doing what they did. Had we allowed the kind of election that happened in 1993 to persist, Nigeria would not be signing peace accord uh, during the elections as we are having now because it's, it's, it mainly signifies that uh, elections are war. The other part of it is to look at the psychological part of it on the citizenry. If elections are credible and better, why is it that people have lost faith in elections in general? What has happened is that the political class have perfected a way of making it look as if elections are credible. If elections are credible, there wouldn't have been a Yaradu, a Musa Yaradu, who came and said, well, you know, I won the election, but the elections were incredible. If elections were credible, you won't have a governor, a sitting governor in Imo State, who didn't participate in an election, who is now a governor of a state. If you, if you think elections are credible, what do you say about Oshun State, where they introduced beavers, and from one machine, according to a tribunal, this is not my position, two beavers reports emerge at the tribunal, and that election has been annulled now. The same thing happens in Ekiti. If elections were credible uh, and free and fair, why is it that we haven't been able to uh, you know, have people vote in a way that politicians will not be hanging around the corner and pulling units and bribing people. Those are not credible elections. And the 2019 election wasn't credible. It wasn't even an election. That's what I said to people, and I've always said it even when, when I was in detention and being interrogated by the DSS, that the election did not happen in 2019. And what happened is that they allocated votes. So, you know, Buhari got the highest vote allocated to him, and they allocated the rest to the rest of us. What we are calling for is free, fair, and credible elections. Nobody could claim that the elections in 2019 were credible, not even inter the international observers who come around, you know, who mostly would even lie about that because they are more interested in a Nigeria that's peaceful and can get their oil from, not the one that is making progress. If elections were credible, why is it that democracy is not giving dividends to our people? So why if elections are credible, why do you need to populate the electoral body with members of the political party that is running the country, you know, card carrying members of APC, uh, federal commissioners in the system. So our party is just telling the truth. In fact, I said, I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd spoken about beavers before a show happened. And I spoke about beavers in Ibadan before a radio, on a radio program that people should not get carried away because every election season, they will come with an electoral act, solid electoral act. Everybody will be praising it. 
you know, and they, or they will come with a piece of machine. This one, this lady was a card reader, and the card reader never, never really worked. And then you bought a bimodal machine, you know, uh, you call it beavers. Bimodal means that, you know, it has one, uh, one hardware and, uh, you know, one, um, one hardware and one software. That is what bimodal means. It's, it's, it's an averagely, you know, like a uh, tablet, uh, but has, does, that doesn't have more than one application. So it needs to connect to the internet. It, you know, you can be manipulated to produce the results you want. In transmitting results, we are transmitting results that have been written and signed by a polling uh, unit supervisor. So what is credible there? Let's just be honest. If you want credible elections, why don't we use technology that allow you to stay in your house, you know, and vote? And the results will come out immediately. And if you don't have a way of checking or knowing if the voter is uh, credible, you can always use uh, the footprints left by the computer. If you can carry out transactions on your phone to send a huge amount of money, why can't you vote once in four years with your devices after having received a special code uh, to vote? And as they are doing in Brazil, in India. So, but we will never do those things because we don't want credible elections. Why do I have to travel to my village to go and vote you know, when I can do it in my house? In which case, you eliminate the polling units, you eliminate vote rigging, uh, you eliminate all these people that are buying votes, because beavers cannot detect vote buyers. And the ESCC don't have the capacity to even go beyond Abuja to detect vote buyers. And even where they have the capacity, they have their allegiances. That's the truth. They work for the, the ruling party. They are the ones who nominated them uh, into these positions. I'm not saying they are not trying in some cases, but you can see that progressively, the political class has figured out how to make election not credible, uh, but make it sound or look like it is credible. So wh wh where does that leave everyone? Because my next question was going to be something you spoke about in passing a bit earlier, when you talked about you know, the redesigning of the Naira. Uh, I wanted to add the issue of withdrawal limits uh, uh, that were to be introduced. And there were quite a number of people who said, again, these were uh, measures to mop up uh, money in circulation, which quite a lot of people uh, alluded to in saying that they were preparing or that some of those you have described as buccaneers were preparing to use uh, uh, for the purposes of vote buying and selling during the elections to mop those uh, monies out of the system. But you don't seem to think that the, the redesigning or indeed the cash withdrawal limits uh, 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 will achieve those purposes uh, going by what you have written and what you have said. You know, brother, I would have, uh, I would have believed you if they redesigned the dollar, right? Why? Because our politicians don't spend Naira. They use dollars. And, you know, one thing you should know about the Nigerian political class or anybody in this kind of government you have in place now, if they ever know that a particular policy we favor the masses, they will never engage in it. I'll tell you that for free. So you go and redesign the Naira, which never happened. The Naira was not redesigned. They just poured dye on the Naira. You know, if you spend the 1,000 Naira now, after a while in your pocket, it will turn to the old one in color. You know, this is called featuring. Uh, they use Snapchat for it. So you've seen different brands of this Naira. They are weak, they are properly, you know, properly designed. I don't even think they have security measures. But what I'm saying to you is that an average bank, right, will first and foremost service politicians before they will get to the masses. What am I saying? If you are rich in this country, you can get the bank manager to bring money to you on a Saturday, on Sunday, they can meet you in church with a bullion van. That's not a problem. It's the masses. Have you ever seen a governor queue up trying to withdraw the new Naira notes? Or have you even seen a counselor withdraw, you know, queue up? It's the poor people that are... And my concern now is that the poor people who might want to vote will now have the little money to even travel to their villages and come back. They have already gone and spent whatever they have in, during the Christmas and New Year. So if, if you are going back to Tupo from Abuja, or you are going to the southeast to go and vote now, you might think twice, because that's where your polling unit is located. All right? Nigerian leaders, <laughs> Nigerian officials never do anything that will favor anybody. Look at the fuel scarcity. You are subsidizing fuel. It is scarce, and it's scarce in the election year. So even if you have money, the millimeter you can withdraw, 
you still have no money to go home because the cost of transportation is triple or even four times what it used to be. Even to go and vote in your polling unit in, within the city, you will not find transportation. So why are we here arguing about something that makes no sense to me? It's the same way I was sitting in detention when they closed the borders. People were praising it. They sponsored people to be praising border closure. It, you know, it turns out that they didn't close the border for certain people. They closed the border in the south. They, reop they opened it in the north. We are smarter than being fooled by these guys who are running the country. At the same time that they're saying, oh, they have to redesign the Naira and put limitation on what you can withdraw. Have politicians stopped having big rallies? You know, don't you see APC rallies? If they are affected by the monetary policy of redesign of the Naira, they would have shut down their operations by now because it takes an average of 500 million for the big parties to hold a rally in any major stadium to fill it up because they pay people. It's a contractual agreement between, you know, there's a cottage industry of people who hire people to be at rallies or move people from one rally to the other interstate. That's why we don't do rallies. Because it's an abuse of people. You don't have it. You have not presented any evidence of this. You haven't presented any evidence of this. I, I haven't presented any <laughs> evidence that. Yes. That no, no, no. I presented that, to that you the evidence cost. that. No, there was a, there was a guy from uh, the Labour Party from Ogun State who came on TV, on Arise TV, to say that, how much they were paying per head. And I would, I would imagine that uh, APC will be paying way more than that. He said, they, they, he said it, he's a, he's a party chairman in Ogun State, that it cost them 100 million to, to do rally. They were the one they were doing in the battle. He said it, and nobody has disputed that. There was another case in, uh, uh, I think, Benway, where some people came out and said, you know, they are support groups and they haven't received money and they went and blocked the home of the chairman or, uh, of the party. That one is, is a well-known fact. I said we want to cover up uh, the politicians. So how much, they actually how much, do buy people to attend their rallies? Per how head. much are you? How much are you spending on your activities in the AAC? Surely you couldn't be. You, you couldn't be that the AAC does not spend money, because politics is about spending. No, no. We so if we if we yes no we, uh, that's transparent. For instance, just to make it easy for you, every month I post on my pages and party pages how much we spend on uh, activities to run the party. That's, that's easy for you to find out. I've been posting it since uh, June, uh, but the media ignores it anyway because it's not salacious. Now, are you funding the activities of the AAC? Uh, how are you crowd, spending money? I know you've said you put it. Yeah. Please go on. Crowdfunding. I, crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is I have one single account for Omoyele S. Showere presidential campaign. It's a Zenit Bank account. And I can tell you the account number, but you call it adverts. So yes, it where people advert. donate, I ask for free donations, and they donate, and that's the money I spent, uh, and in, in addition to my lunch money sometimes. What do you mean by your lunch money? Money that I'm supposed to use to eat. I spend it on campaign activities, my private money. Okay, that's what you mean. But I ask these questions, I raise yes. these questions because... Again, when we speak broadly, it's good that we can speak broadly, but when we come, you know, to the nitty-gritty of it, because now in 2023, um, the elections are close by. You, are, you intend to participate, as you have said already on the program. I'm you participating. Yes, I'm participating. You, no, I've been I mean participating that, in elections since June. That's official. what I mean. No, what I mean is that you will be yes. participating in the election on February the 25th. That's what I mean. Um, yes, I'm a candidate. Uh, you're a candidate as, for that's the what election. I'm trying to say. Yes, you're a yes. candidate for the yes. election. Why do you think you could win? Well, because a lot of people in their millions are tired of this old system of doing politics. They are tired of hunger, starvation. They are tired of scarcity. They are tired of terrorism, banditry. Uh, they are tired of corruption in this country and they've indicated that they want to turn things around. And uh, I have presented myself to do so, and I have made very powerful arguments wherever I've been given the opportunity. And I thank you for the opportunity we have today. And you attest to my credibility of 30 years, consistency of 30 years, honesty of 30 years that you have known me personally. Most people don't know this, especially people who I, we refer to as children of democracy, people who were born around 98, 99 when I left the country and spent 20 years in the U.S. So all these people want a brand new leader. They don't want the same people who were governors for eight years 
and ruined their states. They, are, they don't want people who had never, never stood up for anything, who can stand up for them. I've been standing up for the Nigerian people for most of my life, and I've never been remunerated for it, and I'm not looking for remuneration. I just want to keep doing what I know how to do best, which is stand up for people who are vulnerable uh, in, in our society. And those who may not be vulnerable, but deserve a better place to live. I, not everybody wants to leave Nigeria. Some people want to stay. And there are so many who have left, who have discovered that the grass is not as green as you thought on the other side of the aisle. So I'm standing up for them, and I believe, having been made and uh, given the opportunity to present myself, that Nigerians can see transparently through me and vote for a leader that can stand up and work for them, a leader that is capable, a leader that has integrity, a leader that believes in progress and prosperity for the country, a leader that has ideas and is able to present and share it to millions of our people. That is why I don't even think I would win. I know I will win because that's what would be a win-win for the Nigerian people. And I believe that they will take that decision sooner or later. That's why I said that uh, that National Peace event, that very soon these tables will turn. Indeed. But uh, again, uh, I, I, I have two questions, but let me ask the first one. Uh, uh, in 2019, on this same platform, you, you told me uh, uh, that you believed that you would win. As it turns out, you didn't. And you have said why you I didn't because there was no election. That, that's what I'm referring to. You said no. there was no election, but yeah. the point was that yes. uh, 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 the election took place, results were declared, you didn't win. What makes you think this time will be different? Because I have made that point just in the last question, that more and more people whose eyes weren't open to the ideas I was pushing on your, on your show, if you listen to that show very well in uh, 2019, uh, which I'm sure you've probably watched again, you know, I was pushing the idea of renewable energy, which has now become mainstream. I was pushing the idea of free education, and people now realize that you need it. I was pushing the idea of minimum wage of 100,000. And people were saying at that time that it would cost inflation. Inflation is now at 17% or more. That's depending on who you're listening to. No minimum wage is costing it. What is costing the inflation now, since you are still paying the old, ragged, uh, minimum wage. The truth is that all these ideas that I put out there, there's nobody who can defeat those ideas if we had free and fair election. Anybody who wants to call me a loser in an election must be prepared to hold free and fair election. Then we would congratulate the winner. But don't go and hold a shambolic election, allocate votes to people, and start blackmailing those who disagree with you that the election didn't hold, that uh, they are sore losers. No, that's not how elections are conducted. Now, and that's why I think also... it's an unfair question to ask why I'm saying that there was no election, because most of you actually know the truth, that the election no. of 2019 did not, it wasn't a credible, it wasn't a free and fair election. That That's is why very, they that had is to run to court. Debatable. That is extremely debatable. I don't know well, that it was not The fact that it's debatable at all, I, we should be having elections in which we have no debates about. The no, credibility of elections should not be debated. It should not be something no, subjected to a debate. No, it should happen, and we should be all agreeable with it, because the transparency of election is the most important currency in an election. People went to court in the aftermath of that election and the courts declared that the election was valid, it was free, and it was fair. Remember that. How do you win elections if you don't make alliances with other people, even if they are of like minds, uh, and that sometimes you do uh, things of convenience in order to secure power to help the people that you're so anxious to help? But in this election, we've, we've been the only party that had a solid alliance with the PRP, there is a PRP vanguard, the original PRP that was started by Malam Aminu Kano, which uh, 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 this uh, former uh, governor of uh, Kaduna State, Palarabi Musa, continued. We made an alliance with them. We met in Kano. It was announced everywhere. That's the best alliance that has ever appeared out of uh, this election circle. And you know about it. So those are the kind of Indeed, alliances I do. we make. The alliance I do with pro-people organized uh, parties and organizations. But the most important alliance in this election is the alliance of the oppressed. And we are allied with the oppressed in, in their daily suffering, misery, thinking, and their desire to liberate themselves. There is no other party that has made an open alliance so far. You know, whether it is uh, the APC, PDP, 
or Labour Party or any other party. We are the only openly, we are the only party who has openly entered into a PROP Vanguard Alliance. It's a well-known established fact. And these are the real kind of parties we should be aligning with. Let me ask you uh, a bit in more detail. You referenced it when you were talking about some of the things you told me in 2019, which have now become mainstream. For example, the issue of clean energy, yes. the issue of minimum wage, and so on. What ideas, uh, because there are some issues that have since, between 2019 and now, uh, uh, become very, uh, very important, more important, if you like. Uh, things like the debt burden, uh, what you referenced earlier on fuel subsidy, unemployment uh, uh, is, at, is at an all-time high, uh, even by the statistics uh, given by the authorities themselves. So, I mean, if we take these three, what specific, yes. uh, what specific things would you recommend or would you be implementing were you to be elected, uh, elected president? When I'm elected president, with regards to debt, I will pause the repayment of debt. <clears throat> and that is holding us back and engage in what I call debt audits. What we do is to look at the debt holistically, know who we are owing, how much we are owing, what is uh, the interest rate on this debt, who and where did we get the debt from. Because what we found out with regards to debt when Obasanjo started his debt repayment process was that most of the debts that they claim we owed or monies we borrowed, we never borrowed. In fact, that was what led Buhari to be paying state governments and uh, local governments back the repayment of uh, debts that were illegally deducted from uh, their allocations. Uh, those have now become another source of uh, corruption, but that's a discussion for another day. Uh, with regards to subsidy, I have said it, and I will repeat it, that there's no subsidy or in Nigeria. What is happening is the rich subsidizing their lifestyles through corruption. We know that first, the customs said openly this is an open admission by the customs that Nigeria is not consuming 60 million liters of fuel on a daily basis. So where do the NNPC or whomever is in charge of importing fuel getting it from? The second aspect of it is to make the refineries at home work. We have four refineries that should be working. Even if those refineries don't produce entirely everything we can consume, the only thing we then need to is, uh, consume or import are just a few liters uh, to augment whatever is uh, needed. That has been established, you know, that we are not importing as much as they are claiming. And secondly, if we make our refineries work, even if you are saving 10 naira, according to what a friend of mine, Zach, has said yesterday, who is a development expert in the petroleum sector, that if we are, make, if we are, if we are producing locally, we'll save 10 naira. You multiply 10 naira by 60 million. That's how much you'll be saving per day. That's not a bad idea. And look at it. You say you can't repair your refineries. It's a bad idea for government to be uh, doing business, uh, to be involved in business. But the government that hates business or should not be in business can invest $2.8 billion in a private refinery in Lagos that is coming on stream very soon. So we keep deceiving ourselves that uh, there's subsidy. What we, what we are subsidizing is the responsibility on the part of those who are running all these agencies that are in charge of uh, importing petrol. We are not importing fuel. We are importing petrol because fuel is way beyond petrol. And the subsidy on petrol is the only subsidized product. We are not subsidizing diesel. It's not available. We are not subsidizing kerosene. It's not available. You are not subsidizing uh, Jet A1 fuel. It's not available. So you are not subsidizing even Vaseline. It's not available. What are we talking about? All these issues are just ways of modeling up issues so that we'll not be able to get to the bottom of the corruption that's destroyed this country. And that's what we are there to fix. When we come, we'll get rid of this personnel, these ideas and mentality that makes it comfortable for people to steal and keep stealing from the public and not get, uh, you know, not get fired for it or don't get punished for it. Uh, just, I'm, not going, I'm not coming as president to revenge against anyone, but I will ensure that anybody that's acted vengeance, you know, in, in vengeance against Nigerian people will not get away with their loot. That I've also I've always promised. With regards to employment, 
you know, we have to invest in energy. Number one, that's the number one priority I have, is to turn on the electricity in the country so that a lot of people who may not want to work in government agencies will be able to do their own job. You know, you'll be able to have the cost of production that will enable you to be competitive. This is simple economics and commerce. If you are producing something in China for 10 Naira, you are better off because you have electricity than someone who is producing in Nigeria for 30 Naira. In, in, by the time they use 10 Naira to import it, they still make 10 Naira. That is what is happening to Prince Ankara. Very soon, China will be producing Gary, and everybody will be in trouble because the cost of producing Gary in Nigeria and the cost of them producing it is cheaper. They know how to use cheap labor. But what happens is that they take the product to their country, they reprocess it, and they have you buy it. We need to turn the country around in the area of manufacturing, industrialization. You cannot industrialize without electricity. Forget it. And then the investment that needs to be made in areas of human endeavor like medicine, you know, healthcare, would employ a lot of people. We have already lost over 10,000 nurses, 8,000 doctors. If we employ them or employ over 160,000 nurses, that's the shortage we have, some 80,000 doctors, it will provide jobs. Teachers, those are jobs. And pay them minimum wage that I call living wage. By the time you do that, you invest in your country, you invest in education, healthcare, you will create jobs. The jobs that we talk about in other places are jobs that create value. And what is most important is to think about what is the knowledge economy out there that can be encouraged to come to Nigeria that will also create wealth. Wealth is no longer about, you know, one company. You know, like a Jakuta steel company. People talk about Jakuta as if it's a one size fits all, uh, this thing. But, you know, what is it that you know about the world today? There are the 10 most valuable companies in the world. No oil companies on there except Saudi Aramco. And the reason why Saudi Aramco is doing well is because government is tightly regulating and controlling how oil is sold and how the revenues and proceeds are returned to the country. Here, nobody accounts for it. We haven't got a, a, a dime from selling crude from the NMPC in the last one, I mean, last nine months. I didn't say it. It was the central bank governor that said it. How about security? Because that is the other existential threat. Uh, you referenced it when you talked about, you know, people not being able to walk on the roads, not being able to travel, not uh, having to go long distances to vote when you were answering that question. What do you, what do you intend to do about security? Well, you know, you cannot also talk about security without a holistic approach to it. You know, the most important level of security Nigeria needs is human security, and they are tied to finding employment, they are tied to, uh, you know, solid or, you know, uh, fair wages, they are tied to energy in this country, and then most importantly, they are tied to security agencies doing their real job for which they're hired. And People talk, love to talk about the policing a lot. They love to talk about the army and all that. But nobody is talking about the commander in chief of the armed forces, who is practically a war, a way without official notice or uh, leave. And that is very important in the hierarchy of security. The no, most important person is the commander in chief. The moment uh, you lose that position or is held by somebody who is incompetent, you can't get it right. So that is the way to look at security. But there's a lot of things that are also fundamental about security, and I talked about it yesterday at uh, the NBA conference, which is that is the Nigerian security system meant for the Nigerian people? Have they been attuned, accustomed, or acclimatized to the Nigerian people? The truth is that the Nigerian security system is meant to protect the rich and powerful. That's why instead of you know, a security system that works for all, we have a police state who is going to kill you at the slightest provocation. You know, there are more policemen guarding homes of people in Abuja, where I've lived for the last three, almost four years, than you have on the highway between Zamfara and Shokoto. I traveled between Zamfara and Shokoto in 2019. We only saw one police vehicle. But if you go to the southeast today, because the agitation there threatens the foundation of the owners of Nigeria and their wealth, what happens? You find soldiers every street, every corner, they have the best equipment, they have the best guns, trail that people who are agitating for nationhood because they are tired of the way Nigeria has run their lives down. I'm not supporting the breakup of Nigeria, but I'm just saying that 
when you touch their means of livelihood, you will see police, you will see soldiers. That's what they did to Ken Sarawiwa when they touched uh, the anointing oil, uh, crude oil. So to do all this, it must, there must be a holistic approach. We must improve the life of our people. We must invest in education, invest in uh, electricity, energy. You must invest in people so that they don't turn to crime. Because when you look at Nigeria in 2019, it was more, it's more secure than it is in 2023. Almost every part of the country, all the six regions have huge ungoverned spaces. And that also concerns me about election. How are you going to have elections in places where they are born in INEC offices? Where is the confidence level in INEC in those places? How do you have elections in areas occupied by Boko Haram, occupied by bandits, areas occupied by kidnappers? So that's, that's, that's an issue to be addressed. But I'm just giving a general overview of our security situation. But the solution to it is to also have a holistic solution to security problems ranging from human security, social security for workers, uh, and then cyber security as well. Because when people talk about security, they don't talk about technology in Nigeria. They just talk generally as if every security problem will be solved by carrying an AK-47. In the future, the nature of security will likely be on, uh, on the internet. It will be, it will be cyber, cyberspace based. And nobody's thinking about that. Nobody's thinking about the information wars that will be propelled by uh, cyber security, or that when we rely more and more on computers, it would be the control of our, of, our, of our electricity sources, water sources. And if they are hacked into, you won't get water, you won't get electricity, it will disrupt your flights, and because our lives depend more and more on artificial intelligence. So, these are things that uh, people don't talk about that I will get involved with from day one when I become the president of Nigeria in 2023, sir. Oboyele it's been a pleasure, as always, to speak with you. Nice to see you once again, and best of luck in the elections coming. Thank you. Thank you very time. much. Have a nice day. That's our program today. would, of course, like to hear from you on this conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com, to get started. I am Ladi Akiri Duluali. Goodbye.